Hello and welcome to week 4 of the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In this week, we will uh, start discussing about the supply side of healthcare markets. Now, when we refer to the supply side of healthcare market, it is a, a huge area of uh, research as well as a huge area of uh, materials that can be included uh, to understand the supply side. There are stark differences in the supply side delivery of healthcare models as far as rich developed countries are concerned vis-a-vis -vis the poor developing countries. Uh, there are physicians, there are non-physicians, there are hospitals, there are for-profit hospitals, there are not-for-profit not hospitals, there are uh, public health institutions, private health institutions, there are sub-centers, uh, there are uh, primary uh, healthcare centers and so on. In fact, how the supply side is organized with respect to the different actors, institutions and stakeholders and how healthcare delivery takes place uh, in uh, different countries of the world is a research problem in itself. In uh, this class, uh, we will focus on uh, two uh, specific actors or specific entities of the uh, supply side of the healthcare market. Uh, the economics of which is more or less similar whether we discuss it in the context of developed countries or the developing countries and they are the role of physicians or doctors and the hospitals. Let us begin with today's class. What we will cover today is the supply side of the healthcare market, physicians, physician firms versus other firms and hospitals. So, we will try to understand a typical not-for-profit hospital. Now, let us begin with the basic question of who are the suppliers of healthcare. Often in health economics, we make a distinction between two terms, suppliers and providers. Although suppliers and providers, both of them are on the supply side of the healthcare market, it is important to make a distinction between suppliers and providers because there are implications with respect to the organization of uh, activities when we refer to suppliers and providers. So, the supply side of healthcare market consists of those who are the providers of healthcare. By providers, we mostly refer to physicians, hospitals, clinicians, or clinics, etc., and those who are the suppliers of healthcare, such as pharmaceutical companies. In the context of healthcare, suppliers and providers refer to different entities involved in delivering health related services and products. And often we tend to use these terms interchangeably as suppliers and providers, both of them are on the supply side of healthcare, although these nuances needs to be very clear to a more serious uh, student of uh, or a researcher in healthcare economics. Now, let us um, uh, look at a uh, basic definition of who are suppliers. Suppliers are those organizations or companies that provide medical products and equipment needed for healthcare services. For example, you have medical device manufacturers, example companies that produce surgical instruments, diagnostic equipment and the kind. There are pharmaceutical companies, example companies that manufacture medicines and vaccines or there may be suppliers of medical supplies, example companies that provide disposable gloves, syringes, bandages, etc. For anyone who has uh, been exposed to the medical care industry in any country of the world would understand that this is a huge market in itself where medical supplies are an important part of the healthcare industry. So, what is the role of suppliers? They ensure that healthcare providers have the necessary tools, equipment and medications to treat patients. So, the healthcare suppliers or health supplies that are provided by the suppliers, they do not have a direct interface with the patients. However, they provide these supplies to the uh, uh, physicians and the hospitals so that patients can be treated. Now, who are the providers? Providers are individuals or organizations that deliver healthcare services directly to patients. Uh, often in the context of health systems research, we also refer to uh, government health providers, uh, private health providers and so on. So, uh, providers also refer not just to the doctors or physicians who are working in the uh, public sector or the private sector, but it refers to the entire organization of people who are involved in the public sector or the private sector. 
So, uh, providers examples are physicians and specialists, example general practitioners or cardiologists and surgeons. You have hospitals and clinics, example places where patients receive medical treatment. There are also allied health professionals, example nurses, physiotherapists, radiologists, etc. And what is their role? They are responsible for diagnosing, treating and managing patients health conditions directly. So, what is the key difference between suppliers and providers? Uh, as far as their functions are concerned, suppliers focus on production and distribution of medical products, but providers focus on delivering care and services directly to the patients. Uh, with respect to interaction of patients, suppliers typically do not interact directly with the patients uh, because if you would remember and recall from some of the earlier classes that the doctors or the physicians act as agents of patients in the healthcare market. So, the physicians have an agency function to do and in doing the agency function, it is the physicians who decide what medicines to be delivered to the patients, what uh, surgery to be carried out, what equipment to be used for the a kind of treatment that is being chosen for the patient and so on. So, in this sense, the suppliers typically do not interact directly with the patients, but providers do. A pharmaceutical company is a supplier or a manufacturer of a vaccine, but a clinic is a provider or administers that vaccine to patients. So, this is a clear cut example of how do we differentiate between suppliers and providers. And understanding this distinction helps in recognizing the different roles and contributions each group makes in the healthcare system. Now, I would like to also repeatedly draw your attention to the fact that while we are making this distinction between suppliers and providers, in the context of uh, supply side of healthcare markets, uh, we tend to use these terms uh, interchangeably for a basic understanding of what are the forces or who are the actors and entities that are present in the supply side of the healthcare market. But for a more serious researcher, it will be important to etch out the distinctions between these uh, between suppliers and providers and then decide on where you want to lay your attention, your research attention on, whether you want to understand the economics of the pharmaceutical sector, whether you want to understand the economics of the hospitals, whether you want to distinguish between the organization of public hospitals hospitals versus private hospitals, whether you want to understand the organization of uh, allied physicians and so on becomes very important for the research problem in hand. Now, let us move on. As I said that although there are suppliers and physicians on the supply side, in this uh, class we will focus on physicians and the uh, hospital industry and uh, physicians and hospital industry are two entities that uh, more or less function on similar manner uh, in both the developed and developing countries and there are certain set assumptions and there are certain set uh, ways uh, in which the hospital industry and the physicians or the physician firms behave that warrant some discussion in the context of healthcare economics. So, supply of healthcare is determined by healthcare providers which consists of physicians in the hospital industry. Now, this term physician is a generic term which is used to include all kinds of medical care professionals. Uh, but in the healthcare market, the physician from the economics point of view is basically an economic agent who directs, guides and shapes resource allocation for production of health. So, the role of the physician is extremely important uh, because of the agency function that the physician is playing in the healthcare market and it is based upon his or her supervision that different uh, entities come together and deliver health care to the patients. So, there are intricate nuances that need to be studied with respect to the market for physicians. Modern hospitals are also not just about medical care. Uh, you may have many of you may have had some exposure to modern hospitals, big hospitals and you would realize that it is not just about medical care, but there are several other amenities and even expensive technologies that are a part of the hospital industry including huge administrative and support staff and they are also a part of the uh, healthcare market. So, when we talk about demand for healthcare and supply for healthcare, we are not necessarily only talking about the demand and supply of uh, uh, treatment provided by the doctors or the physicians uh, to the patients, but there is a large array of different entities and actors, suppliers and other providers who are also a part of the healthcare market and healthcare systems also includes a study of all of these entities and actors that are a part of the healthcare market. So, um, 
because there are uh, these uh, huge modern hospitals which includes physicians and non physicians and, a, and an army of administrative and support staff, it necessitates an understanding of the hospital industry as well as their effect on uh, supply. Now, let us focus on physicians. Who are these physicians? Uh, the term physician as I said is a generic term, it is used to include all kinds of medical care professionals. In the healthcare market, the physician is an economic agent, uh, but how is this economic agent directing and shaping resource allocation for production of health? They do so by caring for patients, by planning for capital allocation in hospitals, by providing direction to biomedical research, by planning for manufacturing of drugs and vaccines, building of equipment and supplies for the medical sector. Now, you would presently see that this physician plays uh, dons multiple hats. So, the role of the physician is not, not only to treat the patients, but also the physician plays the role of an entrepreneur in the uh, healthcare industry, where uh, he or she is planning for different kinds of fund allocations in hospitals, the kind of treatment that the physician is carrying out or the kind of discussions that the physician is carrying out in the process of treating of patients. He or she is also providing direction to different kinds of biomedical research. They are planning for manufacturing of drugs and vaccines. Since if you have visited uh, doctors uh, recently, you might see various medical representatives who queue up in front of doctors' cabins uh, to provide uh, new medicines and drugs or uh, show uh, case various uh, drugs and vaccines that have uh, emerged in the market recently. So, there is a lot of activity going on around the physician. The physician is not simply just looking at the patient, but is also looking at various other uh, information. Uh, and uh, and organizational activities surrounding the um, healthcare uh, management of patients. So, as I said, the physician is an economic agent who is playing multiple roles and we need to distinguish between the various roles the physician plays in the productive process of medical care and health. So, um, first, uh, uh, physicians are inputs in the production process. Remember that we have studied about health or status of health or well-being as an output in the production process. So, if we are considering uh, the health as an output or the status of health as an output, then physicians can be considered as input in the production process. A good doctor or a qualified doctor, an informed doctor, physician or uh, the group of uh, physicians and non-physicians depending upon what kind of care you have received for the disease that you are suffering from can uh, directly impact your status of health. So, in that sense, physicians are inputs in the productive process. Similarly, physicians are also entrepreneurs because apart from looking at patients, they are also directing various activities around them that goes towards manufacture of new drugs, that goes towards providing direction to biomedical research or that goes towards management of the hospital industry as well. So, in that sense, physicians can also be looked at as entrepreneurs. Similarly, physician services can also be the final product that involves patients. When we are looking at the hospital industry, the fact that we have qualified doctors doctors can also be the output where other there are other inputs that leads to the production of uh, physician services. So, physicians can be inputs, they can be outputs, they can also be looked at as entrepreneurs. Now, uh, let us consider taking help of uh, a few basic concepts in neoclassical theory of firms as a reference point. Let us try to understand this a little uh, more. Now, we know that in uh, economics when we say that firms hire and control the use of resources, they are guided by the objective of profitability. So, there are profit making firms, firms hire and control the use of resources, they are faced with certain cost curves in the short run and in the long run and their objective is to minimize their cost of production so that they can maximize their rate of profits. Decisions of the firms determine profitability and survival of the firm. Now, how is this different in the case of a, a physician firm? In the healthcare market, a physician firm is not only concerned about profitability or is not just concerned about hiring and control of use of resources, the physician is also concerned primarily about the patient's health and satisfaction given the agency function that he or she has to function in the healthcare market. 
The physician also has to adhere to professional ethics because the physician is bounded by a certain uh, the Hippocratic oath in which the physician is bounded by the, uh, by the ethic of uh, working in the best interest of the patient concerned. Similarly, the physician also has to be concerned about the health and leisure of himself or herself, the time that is dedicated to his or her work because this, is, this involves um, giving a lot of time and energy to the patient's health and well-being. So, to ensure that the physician himself or herself has health and well-being so that he or she can offer adequate amount of health and well-being to the patients, the sufficient amount of adequate amount of time has to be provided to the health and leisure of the physician herself. So, in other words, the physicians and the firms are basically interacting with each other. When the physician meets all of these objectives, objective of meeting patient's health and satisfaction, adhering to professional ethics, uh, ensuring that there is a work-life balance as far as himself or herself is concerned, then it limits any incentive on the part of the physician firm to maximize profitability considerations. So, in the case of a perfectly competitive equilibrium, uh, when we are talking about uh, competitive firms that move towards profit maximization as their objective function, in the case of physician firms, the physician firms may not be guided by the objective of profit maximization, uh, they cannot be guided by the objective of profit maximization. So, then the physician firm and its production function, how does it look like? The product of a physician firm is basically an array of diagnosis, referrals, treatments of patients with various mix of diseases and illnesses and the physician firm must involve at least one licensed physician who uh, will be responsible for who is under oath to provide responsible uh, care to the patients because it is a matter of life and death. There may be other labor inputs including f other physicians, nurses, receptionists, bookkeepers, accountants, lawyers and laboratories. There may be non-labor equipment including physical office, office equipment, medical equipment, computers, supplies, electricity and insurance. So, the physician firm uh, in this case the output is that of providing quality services to uh, the patient uh, concerned and the input. Uh, or when we say quality um, uh, treatment to patients that includes uh, a whole lot of, it is a group of deliverables that are provided to the patient which includes diagnosis, referrals, etc. And the uh, inputs are not uh, just physicians but it includes also non-physicians and a lot of support staff as well as equipment and laboratories. So, the difference between a physician firm and a regular firm is that the list of inputs will not reveal much about the economic behavior of the organization and it is not necessary that the least cost combination of inputs will produce an output leading to maximum profits and this is where the basic uh, theory of firm uh, assumption is uh, uh, challenged as far as physician firms are concerned. In the theory of firms, uh, in a profit maximizing firm, we understand that the firms have to pursue least cost combination of input so as to maximize their uh, profits, uh, their to maximum output and therefore maximize their profits. But in the context of the physician firms, because he or she has to keep in mind the various uh, ethical considerations, it is not necessary that the least cost combination of inputs will be pursued and therefore it is not necessary that they will produce an output leading to maximum profits. In a regular firm, we can assume a substitution of one resource for the other. For example, labor units can be substituted for capital and vice versa. All those students, uh, learners who have been introduced to the basic uh, microeconomic theory of firms would know that when we consider two uh, factors of production, labor and capital as two factors uh, which are used uh, for production of output in the case of firms, the one of the standard assumptions we take in the case of the theory of firms is that labor and capital are substitutable. But in the case of physician firms, capital and labor is not substitutable because the labor here is that of specialized labor which uh, includes long uh, years of study, which includes long years of being regulated and facing licensure procedures in the market, in the healthcare market. So, in a physician firm, substitution may not be possible due to licensing, limitations of technology with doctor diagnosis, professional qualifications and so on. As the physician firm assembles the final product that is treatment including diagnostics, they generate a demand for inputs that varies inversely with the price per unit of those inputs. 
and in the healthcare market there are physicians and non physician care providers so the healthcare market uh, the supply side of the healthcare market which includes uh, in reference to physician firms needs to be understood the pricing that is uh, made with respect to disease diagnosis diagnostics etc the different kinds of laboratory tests etc has to be viewed in light of the special considerations that guide the uh, physician firms on the supply side now there here is a question that i would like to pose to the uh, learners which i would be happy to receive uh, responses and comments uh, to this question on the portal uh, does india have a doctor led or a physician led model of healthcare what is the doctor to patient ratio in india what is the role of nurses and other allied health professionals in india it will be interesting to look at some of the discussions that come up on the portal with time as we move towards the ending of the course i am sure we will be able to uh, answer some of these questions now let us also uh, also devote some time to understanding uh, investing in human capital or the making of a physician now uh, we have been discussing quite a lot about human capital and uh, as we move towards the economics of education we will uh, understand a little more about the concept of human capital and how it can be uh, contradicted with the concept of physical capital but we must understand that the making of a physician is an important indicator for what will be the wages of the physician when once the physician makes it to the market for healthcare now becoming a doctor is an arduous task for example in india to apply for medical college a student has to be in the science stream till the 12th grade and then they have to sit for the mbbs entrance exam and most of us would would know that um, application for the mbbs entrance exam or clearing the mbbs entrance exam often uh, candidates drop 2 to 3 years of their regular study and uh, devote time for preparation for the entrance exam so when we are talking about uh, wages of physicians in the long run one must also account for the opportunity cost of having been out of education or dropping education or preparing for uh, being in the market and of course there are other issues of not being able to make it to the market as well uh, but nonetheless it is understandable that becoming a doctor is an arduous task in a country such as india and it is so for most countries across the world the training in medical college consists of theory classes and practical dealing with real patients learning about patient history and diagnosis internship which is compulsory work under a senior in clinical departments on a rotation basis at this point however they can only treat patients but cannot issue certificates so this is basically to say that students when they make it into the medical colleges while they are receiving uh, clinical uh, training they are uh, they are providing a lot of their time and effort and energy towards uh, treating patients but without uh, getting the licensing required for providing certificates independently which means that the students are spending substantial amount of time under a supervisor which otherwise could have been spent elsewhere if we have to account for the opportunity cost of the time foregone of being in the labor market uh further once the degree is completed and permanent registration is provided by the medical council they can start their practice as general practitioner but for any specialization they will have to sit again for a masters entrance exam and on top of that physicians in india deal with several problems like that of very low doctor to patient ratio prone to errors due to work overload conflict between doctors and attendants of patients low internship stipends and so on now this is to give you a view about the time required for a candidate or for a labor a unit to be invested in education to be able to come out as specialized labor force in the healthcare market and uh, if we have to put a time uh, finite time to it uh, it is uh, not hard to imagine that people spend about uh, 6 to 12 years attaining this education which is basically an investment of resources of time and energy of being transformed into human capital now uh, we know that uh, uh, wages uh, vary with the cost of uh, learning uh, the business economist adam smith uh, being one of the first writers about this in the wealth of nations the basic neoclassical economics also teaches us that the marginal productivity of labor uh, decides the wage rate of the uh, labor 
Now, even though the process of becoming a doctor remains the same in almost all countries, wages vary significantly depending on whether medical education is subsidized or not. Uh, scholars like Bhattacharya and all in their book have compared the wages of a student who is thinking of becoming a doctor but is also considering another career of that of a professional surfer. And the income paths for both the professions is then presented in two situations. In the first situation for countries where medical education is not subsidized like the United States and the second situation for countries where medical education is heavily subsidized like that of England and Germany. For the sake of uh, the Indian learners, I have added India also in here because in India, as far as government medical education is concerned, we have uh, highly subsidized subsidized uh, medical education, but of course, uh, students pursuing uh, medical education in the private sector have to pay a heavy price for it. Let us look at both of these situations in this slide. This uh, refers to uh, a situation of uh, non-subsidized medical education. This is non-subsidized medical education and this situation refers to subsidized medical education. Now, you would see that in the first uh, situation of non-subsidized medical education, this interval here is the interval that you are uh, pursuing medical education and the income is below 0, which means that because the cost of acquiring this medical education is very high, the student is suffering from negative incomes. So, there are uh, negative incomes during the interval A, where the student is pursuing medical education in the situation of a non-subsidized medical education. Now, the interval B is the period where uh, there is some minimum income that is earned by the student, but this is the period during which the student is under internship and is not fully certified to be uh, providing uh, legal medical care in the healthcare market. So, uh, for a substantial amount of time, uh, the uh, candidate here, the student here is uh, earning minimum incomes, but the amount of investment that the student is making as far as time investment is concerned is huge. But when in the interval C is the period when the student uh, has already transformed into a physician and then there is a huge uh, rise in the incomes for the entire duration that the student is a certified physician in the situation where there is non-subsidized medical education. Now, contrast this with the student who with the same student who is also uh, thinking about having a career as a surfer where the relative levels of income is low compared to the final levels of income that is being uh, imagined by the physician. But for the entire duration that the student would like to be a, a surfer, the relative levels of income are uh, higher, much higher compared to the time when the student is thinking of pursuing a medical education, suffering negative incomes and minimum incomes during the period of internship. So, there is a trade-off between time invested in uh, trying to be a fully certified physician in the healthcare market vis-a-vis -vis following other professions which for a considerable period of time uh, might provide better opportunities um, to the student. It then becomes a matter of choice for the student concerned whether the student would like to invest that time uh, in uh, pursuing medical education or rather invest the time in some other profession because the opportunity cost of pursuing medical education is very high. Now, if we contrast that to a situation where there is a subsidized medical education, you would see that this interval during which the student is pursuing medical education, there are no negative incomes. There are no negative incomes and this is more or less so also in the case of uh, uh, Indian students following medical education in government medical colleges, this cannot be said so for students pursuing medical education in private medical colleges. Now, uh, during the period interval B, where the student is under internship and is not fully certified yet, he or she also earns some uh, stipend or income, but you would notice that this amount of income is much less compared to what is being uh, provided in the case of non-subsidized medical education. 
and in the final interval period C where the student becomes a full fledged uh, physician the income rises uh, drastically. But it is again if you compare it to the situation uh, the first situation of non subsidized medical education it is lower compared to the first situation. Uh, similarly, the surfer profession gives relatively uh, higher levels of income during the period that the student is pursuing medical education or is uh, carrying out internships and is not a fully satisfied physician. So, it is a matter of opportunity cost foregone uh, or the opportunities foregone uh, for being in education uh, for a considerably long period of time and this is where uh, time investment in pursuing education matters and ultimately impacts the wages in the long run. I have discussed the details of these uh, figures in the next uh, slide. So, medical education not subsidized situation interval A refers to pursuing education, cost of fees, negative income, interval B refers to internships and minimal wages and interval C refers to rise in wages after the degree. In the case of subsidized education situation interval A uh, is subsidized medical education sacrifices less income than the previous case. Interval B is internship lower wages than previous cases and interval C is rise in wages after the degree, but usually lower than the previous case of non subsidized medical education. Now, uh, let us also pay some attention to the returns to specialization. So, the fact that uh, the choice to spend uh, the amount of time in the uh, labor market uh, is taken and the duration the time uh, that is invested in the labor market in education uh, which will uh, provide wages in the labor market if we have to take into consideration these factors we would see that the amount of time spent in education usually is uh, the choice is made depending upon the decision whether the returns to education will be higher in the next period and this is what is referred to as a returns to specialization. So, we will take this up when we are uh, understanding demand for education uh, in the next week. So, even though all doctors are well paid, but some doctors with specialization say in surgery or cardiology earn even more. Such salary differentials may persist even in competitive labor market equilibrium because of some special characteristics of the health labor market. Such high returns are justified due to longer and uncertain working hours, longer period of education and training and even because specialists are highly skilled. Now, let us uh, also bring back the focus on the uh, concept of uh, physician agency. We began with the idea that there are physicians and physician firms. We tried to contrast and see how physician firms are different from um, private firms or uh, private firms the way we understand in economics uh, who follow the objective function of profit maximization or sometimes revenue maximization, sometimes sales maximization and so on. And we saw that the uh, physician firms are different from these kinds of firms because they are bounded by certain ethical requirements that, uh, that allows them to compromise on the concept of uh, um, profit maximization. But is that so always? Due to information asymmetry between the patient and the doctor, the patient appoints the doctor physician as an agent for their health. This is how we understand the relationship between a patient and the doctor. So, the patient demands health care because he or she is suffering from a disease and the patient goes to a doctor. So, the social contract between the patient and the doctor is that of the fact that the patient does not have enough information about his or her disease and therefore, the patient appoints the doctor or as an agent for their own health. And keeping with the Hippocratic oath, the doctor should follow the optimal medical practice and prove to be good agents of their patient's health. But doctors often face several types of incentives in the market which may uh, provoke them to deviate away from optimal medical practice under certain situation and this is uh, usually categorized under two heads in healthcare uh, economics. One is physician induced demand and second is demand due to defensive medicine. So, what is physician induced demand? This is basically extra demand for health related goods and services induced by the advice of the physician often guided by the doctor's own financial goals and may not be in the best interest of patients. 
So, this is referred to as physician induced demand and the hospital industry, the care industry, the healthcare industry has uh, uh, been in the controversy for having faced very high rates of physician induced demand as far as the healthcare demand is concerned which leads to very high out of pocket expenditures on the uh, part of the uh, uh, patients. Similarly, there are there is defensive medicine, there may be unnecessary tests or medicines that are prescribed by the doctor to guard or defend themselves against malpractice lawsuits and to avoid conflict with patients attendance. And another aspect of defensive medicine is that they may refer high risk patients to other doctors. So, um, this is also possible. Uh, in the healthcare market. So, even though the patients are uh, appointing in a way the doctors as their agents of, uh, uh, of uh, treatment or patient care, uh, they may be a uh, victim of physician induced demand and defensive medicine that may adversely impact the health of the patient concerned. A related area of uh, discussion in the context of physician induced demand or defensive medicines is also that of racial discrimination. An immediate consequence of physicians agency in supply of health is usually manifested in racial discrimination by physicians. There are many scholars who have carried out study in the context of racial discrimination and healthcare delivery. Uh, racial discrimination usually results in differential treatments for different racial groups. Uh, there are two basic types of racial discrimination that are seen. Uh, one is taste based discrimination uh, which uh, basically means that differential medical treatment are followed by physicians because of their own personal bias and prejudices. So, uh, there may be physicians or doctors who do not cater to the needs of a particular race or a caste or religious group and so on and that is because of the uh, this is this defies the ethical considerations that they are bound to uh, keep. Uh, however, despite that there may be physicians who, uh, who discriminate based upon uh, the racial group that the patients belong to and this kind of racial bias is usually considered inefficient in economics. Uh, similarly, there can be racial discrimination based on statistical discrimination where it is proved that uh, there are groups, uh, racial groups uh, which are uh, discriminated against because of historical discrimination against them uh, guided by historical facts, figures or trends or due to biological reasons and this is generally considered efficient. So, let us uh, try to conclude the discussion on physicians or physician firms as suppliers of healthcare. Uh, what we have seen is that the firm is an economic entity designed to make decisions and physician firms involve at least one licensed physician. Product of a physician firm is an array of diagnoses, referrals, treatments of patients with a mix of diseases and illnesses. The difference between a physician firm and a regular firm is that the list of inputs will not reveal much about the economic behavior of the organization. It is not necessary that the least cost combination of inputs will produce an output leading to maximum profits. In a regular firm, we assume that substitution of resources will be possible. For example, labor for capital will be possible, but in a physician firm, substitution may not be possible because of licensing issues, because of specialization issues. There are limitations of technology without doctor diagnosis, professional qualifications and so on. So, in this context, how do we then uh, think of an aggregate supply curve as far as physicians are concerned? The aggregate supply of physicians in the labor market and of physician firms in the final product market is basically the horizontal submission of all supplies of each doctor or firm participating in the market, which we usually see in the case of an upward sloping supply curve. In the case of the physician labor supply, physicians may decide to retire. So, they may withdraw their services from the labor market, but this does not necessarily change the final product market because if the physician is employed in a group, the group may simply hire another doctor from the market. If the physician has been an entrepreneur directing a physician firm, the firm may be sold to another physician and so on. So, this is how we conclude the physician uh, firms in the market. Now, let us move to the understanding of hospitals. So far, we have been focusing on one entity that is physicians or physician firms and how they behave on the supply side in the market. 
but we also have hospitals uh, in on the supply side and this is the major entity on the supply side that most competitive economies market based economies now have moved towards of course there are differences in different countries depending upon the health system that the countries are uh, pursuing but it is uh, it, it makes sense to look at how these hospitals function on the supply side so everyone who falls uh, ill seriously will find themselves in a hospital and hospitals stand as a center for medicine and most of the decisions made about the delivery of medical care in hospitals are taken for example whom to admit what procedures to use which drugs to be administered to the patient how long will the patient stay in hospital and where the patient should go upon discharge are made by persons who are neither employees of the hospital nor under its direct control or supervision and therefore we need to understand how a hospital is organized in the uh, in modern day economies now typically there are not for profit hospitals uh, now hospitals can and do earn profits however because of their form of organization they may not cannot and do not distribute such profits to shareholders in a typical for profit organization there are shareholders of the organization who are the residual claimant of the profits of the organization which means that they receive any revenue of the firm after all the variable costs of production have been paid for after all its costs including labor material supplies interest on bonds taxes and so on the profits of the organization is then distributed among the shareholders but the not for profit organization typically a not for profit hospital does not have shareholders and hence there are no legally designated residual claimant of the not for profit hospital so in the absence of residual claimant their profits must be distributed to somebody else so how and to whom they do this affects the uh, product mix what is to be uh, produced in the hospital the costs the input mix and also the size of the hospital who is the residual claimant and how the uh, profits or the revenue of the hospital is distributed determines ultimately the size of the hospital now typically this is how a not for profit hospital looks like at the top of the organizational chart is the board of trustees they are empowered by the hospital's legal charter to direct all that goes on within the hospital and the members of the board usually elect their own successors in this sense the board is referred to as self replicating and they typically serve without any pay the board members have an important role to play because they own no stock in the hospital but they also are mostly uh, influential people who donate money to the hospital they are also providing overall direction to the hospital they are in many cases also responsible for organizing doctors within the hospital they provide information on who to hire from where to hire they utilize their own social networks in bringing doctors and physicians to the hospital and so on so they choose who manages the hospital and provide overall strategic policy and advice to those managers next in line are uh, the administrative officers of the hospital with assigned roles at the top you have a president to whom several vice presidents report to from their respective departments for example you have vp finance planning nursing support services professional services and uh, so on a prototype of such division of responsibility as i just showed in the last figure might include vice presidents for finance planning marketing nursing professional departments example emergency room laboratory social service physical therapy etc and support departments for example food service laundry supplies housekeeping although every hospital's organizational chart is unique to each of these in turn report middle managers in various areas now much of the hospital's activity focuses around subunits serving particular type of patients commonly described by the physical location of the unit of its function for example you have obstetrics and gynecology intensive care units emergency room delivery etc these units commonly have 20 to 40 beds and operate under the immediate supervision of a head nurse around whom all the other activities revolve and these uh, charge uh, nurses direct Uh, all of the nursing care and coordinate almost all patient care given on their units so for example if a patient received medication the pharmacy delivers them to the floor where a medication nurse administers them similarly if a patient receives physical therapy 
either the therapist comes to the patient room or the patient is delivered to the therapist's unit. If an X-ray is to be taken, a similar process is carried out. If a lab test is to be taken, a phlebotomist comes to the patient's room to draw a blood sample and so on. Meals are brought from the kitchen to the floor and delivered to the patient. All specialists performing these activities report organizationally to their supervisor in their respective departments. Now, in this complex of different kinds of interactions between the, the administrative staff, the presidents, the president, the vice presidents, the nurses and various kinds of specialists catering to different, different departments, where is the physician, where is the doctor? The doctor who admitted the patient to the hospital in the first place uh, while uh, looking at the entire uh, hierarchy of uh, the uh, staff, we have not seen a physician yet. Now, this is where it is important to understand the role of the physician or the doctor in a modern not-for-profit hospital. The doctor is typically not an employee of the institute. He or she has no boss up the line. The one person upon whom this entire activity depends has only a weak and ambiguous organizational tie to the hospital, which is the medical staff. The hospital medical staff has its own organizational chart and bylaws of operation. The staff is divided by medical specialty. If the hospital is sufficiently large, these departments may have subdivisions as well, reflecting subspecializations of uh, doctors. The hospital stands as a center of modern medicine. Hospitals should be thought of as two separate economic entities. There are physicians and there are administrative staff. The physicians treat patients and demand medical goods and services like syringes, operating rooms, nursing care, etc. The administrative staff consists of nurses and other hospital employees who work to supply these medical goods and services. So, there needs to be a coordination between the doctors or the physicians and the administrative staff and hospitals simultaneously seek to attract doctors to their medical staff and patients to their hospitals. Doctors receive admission to the hospital by application to the hospital, normally to the board of trustees who are responsible for the hospital's overall activity. An important difference emerges between the line management and employees of the hospital and to the medical staff. Uh, the uh, line management have a contract with the, uh, with the hospital. The hospital reviews their performance, pays salary and wages and can fire them. The doctors on the other hand do not have such relationship with the hospital. They receive no income directly from the hospital. Their performance is subject to a very different and weaker review process with very few exceptions they cannot be fired because their interface is directly with the patients and the patients consultation fees. So, there are two things that ensure the professional independence of the doctors in a not for profit hospital. One is the ownership of the practice, the practice of the physician does not mean that the hospital employs the doctor. The hospital owns the group which in turn employs the doctor. Now, this may look like a small distinction, but uh, this is the distinction that limits the hospital's control over the doctor or the physician uh, considerably. In the US, for example, there are many state laws regarding the practice of medicine that limits the hospital's control over physician behavior, uh, even when the hospital owns the medical practice. The general legal structure of most states in the US prohibits the corporate practice of medicine, which means that corporates may not practice medicine and doctors may not work for corporations. Now, we need to look at uh, some of these rules and regulations uh, country-wise. However, uh, it is important to look at the US model of uh, not-for-profit hospitals because that is one model that has been replicated in many countries across the world, including India. And uh, we can draw a lot of lessons from the prototype uh, not-for-profit hospital that we see in the case of the United States. Moving on, in the ownership of medical practice, the practice is partnership of people. Uh, this is what is referred to by medical practices. The hospital owns the practice. Doctor works for real people, not a corporation in the eyes of the law. So, therefore, when there are legal, medical legal cases in the context of patients, it is always the doctor which is held responsible because the immediate intervention that is made on the patient is that of by the doctor. The doctor writes orders in the patient's chart that direct virtually the entire flow of activities for each patient. These orders create demands for activities within the hospital which the hospital organization supplies. The doctor captains the ship 
ordering when to start the engines, which direction to go and how fast to move and the hospital has to respond no matter what order the, direct, the doctor gives. Now it is in this context I would again pose a question to the learners about hospital management in doctor owner hospitals. Uh, this is one of the major failure in uh, many countries including that of India. You can think of nursing homes in Indian setups where uh, there are doctor entrepreneurs who are the owners of these hospitals and how they can be uh, understood vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, other corporate hospitals or not-for-profit hospitals in the Indian setup. These are separate research problems and research questions in itself and anybody who is interested to pursue this uh, can uh, think, start thinking about these problems in the Indian context and let me assure you that there are inadequate studies in the Indian context. Uh, students of health economics can consider these as their research problems. So, the hospital is really two separate organization. One is the line management and the medical staff uh, which serves the role of supply and demand in the market of hospital care. The hospital is really a job shop in which each product is unique and the hospital is set up to provide inputs to the craftspersons who direct the output on this of this job shop. The patient here agrees to two contracts in a hospital. One is with the hospital and second is with the doctors. Now remember that the doctor here is the agent of the patient. So when the patient is uh, getting into a contract with the hospital, while uh, the person to whom the uh, patient directly depends upon or trusts is that of the doctor. The hospital management works uh, in its uh, own uh, organizational uh, way, but the uh, doctor is the person who is the agent of the uh, patient here and therefore that relationship, that, that contract of trust is of utmost importance when the patient agrees to admitting himself or herself to a hospital. So in the contract with the hospital, the patient promises to pay for care and the hospital promises to provide the necessary medical care under the direction of the patient's physician. In the contract with the doctor, the patient promises to pay for care and the doctor promises to provide care as needed and to supervise the activities of the hospital. So then the question, who is the residual claimant of the not-for-profit hospital? Uh, because there are so many different entities within the not-for-profit hospital. You have the line management, you have managerial staff, administrative staff, the physicians, the doctors, the board of uh, trustees, the president, the vice presidents, who then uh, becomes a residual claimant of the revenue generated out of the not-for-profit hospital. There is no clear-cut answer for this, but however, one would like to believe that it is the people who are the recipients of the residual claimant in the sense that because uh, the care received by patients and people are done by the doctor and the physician and the doctor physician has a lot of power within himself or herself to direct the organizational activities of the hospital. So the revenue that is generated out of not-for-profit hospital can be sent back to the hospital which will ultimately be in the best interest of people whether it is uh, adoption of new technology, whether it is adoption of uh, more resources uh, to be uh, spent on different departments, whether it is um, hiring of uh, new doctors, better doctors, more specialization areas, all of these decisions are incumbent upon the indications that are being given by the doctor who is the agent of patients or people in this in the supply side of the healthcare industry. Now while we are studying uh, the uh, supply side of healthcare economics, let me also uh, take you through to India's healthcare delivery model which we will do in some detail in one of the classes. But it will be helpful for us to imagine about how um, the healthcare delivery model in India looks like uh, because for the learners of this course, uh, India's healthcare delivery is much closer uh, to be uh, able to imagine uh, what happens on the supply side. So in India, we have both the public and private sector. In the public sector, which is governed by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and this sector provides healthcare services at various levels. There are primary, secondary and tertiary levels of healthcare. Um, similarly, we also have the private sector which includes a wide range of providers uh, uh, ranging from small clinics to large corporate hospitals and it plays a significant role in urban areas and offers uh, specialized services. 
In India, we have a three-tier system. Uh, mostly when we uh, try to understand governments catering to uh, healthcare services. At the primary level, there are primary healthcare institutions that involve sub-centers and primary health centers, community health centers, and these centers provide basic healthcare services and preventive care. Uh, we have secondary health care which includes district hospitals and sub-district hospitals that offer more specialized services and act as referral centers for primary health care units. And we have tertiary health care which comprises specialized hospitals and medical institutions providing advanced medical treatment and research facilities. There are a few other very important features as far as India is concerned because we have a mixed system of healthcare delivery. Governments although play a very important role in our healthcare delivery processes. So, we have various kinds of extensive national health programs, uh, numerous national health programs targeting specific diseases and health issues uh, such as tuberculosis, AIDS, maternal and child health and universal immunization programs and so on. Recently, we have had a social insurance program called the Ayushman Bharat scheme, uh, which aims to achieve universal health coverage by providing health insurance to economically weaker sections and setting up health and wellness centers. We also have an up and coming insurance and financing mechanism, which is a mixed health financing system with out of pocket expenditures, government funding as well as health insurance schemes and public expenditure on healthcare is uh, relatively low compared to global standards as far as India is concerned. There are some other important features as far as India's healthcare delivery model is concerned. We have various regulatory frameworks governed by multiple uh, regulatory bodies uh, to ensure standards in medical education, practice and hospital management. These include the Medical Council of India, National Medical Commission and so on and so forth. Uh, there are various kinds of technological interventions, digital health programs and so on. Uh, there are continuous efforts to improve infrastructure including buildings and new hospitals and there are a sizable amount of capital expenditures that are made on healthcare and there are various public health initiatives as well with focus on uh, health awareness, disease prevention, sanitation, nutrition and so on. This is a general model, uh, a pyramid model of healthcare that we generally see. At the lowest tier, we have community health centers, primary health centers and sub-centers and the health and wellness centers. At the secondary level, we have district hospitals and sub-district hospitals, uh, state medical colleges and hospitals are the tertiary level. Uh, we also have national level hospitals and there are various kinds of specifications at each level. Uh, if you look at the population specification, community health centers uh, look at a service population of 80,000 to 120,000. Uh, primary health centers uh, services 20,000 to 30,000 and there are, there are sub centers and health and wellness centers that are peripheral centers and services population of 3,000 to 5,000 through community health officers, female health workers and multipurpose uh, workers. So, with this we end today's class, uh, I will see you in the next class. Thank you. Mm -hmm.